Okay, we're going to talk about abdominal pain in the physical exam, uh, doing something I call the abdominal compass. So what you're looking at here is a cartoon of the abdomen. So here's sort of the, the uh, inconal canals. Here's the umbilicus or belly button, and this is uh, the, the ribs. And so we're looking at the abdomen. This is the patient's arms right here. So now I've overlaid a, a compass over the abdomen with the umbilicus at the center of the compass. And so you can see we have our directions. And so I like to use this model to point to different areas of the abdomen uh, to help guide sort of clinical thinking when you're evaluating someone with abdominal pain, especially considering a couple things like the location of the pain and especially where they're tender on physical exam. Um, I've also seen this done with a clock face. So you could put the clock face over the belly button. You could do a compass. You could do whatever works for you. I'm just going to do a compass. I like the idea of that... Um, you know, we have this thing that's sort of guiding us or giving us direction if we're lost, so to speak. So let's use the compass today. All right, let's start. Okay, so you can see that the compass is now pointing at the right upper quadrant. And so uh, the way I run this exercise and the way I teach my students and the way I think is I just think, okay, what is literally under this area? What are all the organs and structures and things under here that can either get infected or inflamed or cause pain? Or have any sort of pathology and that's how I run my differential so let's think about things in the right upper quadrant okay so now we're looking at the right upper quadrant and so these are all the things that sort of live in this area so the liver the gallbladder the cholecystic duct and uh, even consider things that uh, are right above the diaphragm like the pleural space or even a, a right lower lobar pneumonia uh, could all cause maybe pain in this area and so you know the liver when it, it is acutely enlarged it can stretch and cause pain so like an acute hepatitis can be associated with uh, pain up here i sometimes hear uh, students tell me uh, you know cirrhosis as a cause of pain but remember liver cirrhosis is where the liver is scarring and it's shrinking and it tends to not be painful at all so um, stretching of the capsule however is painful so acute hepatitis causes pain the gallbladder there could be biliary colic or acute cholecystitis cholecystic duct you can have infection there and that's called cholangitis and then uh, anything that's causing uh, pleurisy or a, a pneumonia can cause sort of re referred pain up here anything that's irritating the diaphragm can cause pain so think about what just lives in this area and that can help you with your differential okay what about the epigastric area so things that live near here so you know, the esophagus is actually a little more superior than this, but, you know, I guess it's possible someone could have a uh, reflux and feel it in the epigastric area. I feel like most people tend to have it in the substernal chest, um, but it's it's close by, so it, it's certainly possible. I've had some people describe that, but also the stomach is in this area, so things that can happen in the stomach, uh, gastritis, gastric ulcer disease, um, that can present with epigastric pain. Remember the duodenum is in this area, so duodenitis or uh, peptic ulcer there. And also in the retroperitoneal space, but still uh, in this area is the pancreas. And um, I feel like it's uh, uh, very specific to have epigastric pain when uh, you have pancreatitis. And so a lot of patients will complain of epigastric abdominal pain that radiates to the back um, because the pancreas is retroperitoneal, but the pain will be localized around here. And remember, um, also in the retroperitoneal space is the aorta. So um, it's possible someone could have a very large aortic aneurysm or dissection, and they may have pain in this area. So always keep these things in mind. Just literally go from skin to <laughs> the spine and consider all the structures in this area. And while we're on the epigastric area, um, it's also worth noting that an inferior wall MI uh, can rarely cause uh, epigastric pain. So especially in the elderly person, um, keep this in your differential because otherwise you may miss it. So inferior wall MI sometimes presents as sort of a vague epigastric abdominal pain. So here in the left upper quadrant, um, think about what lives here. So the, the spleen lives here. And so uh, the spleen can be enlarged and that can cause pain. You can have a splenic abscess or a splenic infarction. And uh, remember, we're close to the diaphragm. So just above the diaphragm is the pleura and uh, lungs. So, you know, when lungs are infected and pneumonia can cause pain in this area, a uh, pleural uh, effusion or pleuritis can cause pain in this area and um, uh, the spleen, as we mentioned before. So next, when we're thinking about the, the flank, so um, how about for this, I'll say as we're looking sort of east and west, uh, this is the opportunity I want you to start thinking about 
things in the retroperitoneal space um, that are more, um, you know, more inferior to the pancreas. So the things that are in the retroperitoneal space down here are the kidneys. So, you know, uh, very large kidneys, like polycystic kidney disease can be quite painful. Um, the cysts can get infected. That could be painful. Or, you know, pyelonephritis can be painful. Perinephric abscess can be painful. And remember, um, you know, the ureters coming out of the kidney going down towards the bladder. But if you throw a kidney stone, right, so nephrolithiasis could be quite painful. Um, patients typically present with flank pain and it can sort of wrap around and radiate uh, down to the front. So uh, they may present with uh, flank pain that comes around to the anterior uh, uh, abdomen. And then also, um, while we're in the retroperitoneum, you know, aortic pain, I'm not trying to say it will present as flank pain necessarily, but it may be sort of a vague lower back pain or, uh, as we mentioned above, sort of this epigastric pain that points to the back. I just want to get you thinking about the retroperitoneal space. And so this way we're covering both sides. So here on the on the right side as well, there's the kidney, there's the ureter, and the aorta. Think about those retroperitoneal uh, structures when you're looking at the flanks. Okay, next in the left lower quadrant, so uh, the sigmoid colon is in this area. And so, um, you know, I didn't mention before, you know, there really is some colon almost everywhere. There's ascending colon here, transverse, descending, and then sigmoid. And, um, you know, something like uh, colitis could present with pain in the left lower quadrant. Really, uh, I mean, I guess any other area as well. But um, something like diverticulitis tends to affect the sigmoid colon more than anywhere else. So you would send, tend to see that in the left lower quadrant. Um, so colitis, diverticulitis, a perforated diverticulitis leading to abscess. Um, that could occur here also in uh, females who have ovaries. So an ovary is in the left pelvis. And so uh, you could have a painful ovarian cyst. You could have a um, ascending infection or ovarian torsion, which is a sort of a vascular catastrophe where the ovary sort of twists on itself and the blood supply in and out of the ovary is compromised. Okay, so now we're pointing south, and so this is the suprapubic area, and so this area uh, contains the bladder, so sometimes just a very distended bladder can be easily palpable, and that's painful because of, uh, let's say, bladder outlet obstruction or uh, cystitis, so an infection essentially of the bladder can be painful upon palpation. Um, also in females, you know, a uterus can be painful. Sometimes a large uh, uterus that contains fibroids um, can be palpable. Um, sometimes there's a, a ascending uh, infection, either chlamydia or gonorrhea it causes something called pelvic inflammatory disease that could cause a very painful uterus. So suprapubic pain, uh, think bladder, uh, uterus, Okay, now we're uh, pointing to the right lower quadrant, and in this region, so it's uh, similar to the left lower quadrant, and then we got colon and ovary, but importantly, we have the appendix. So um, obviously, an inflamed and ruptured appendix can cause appendicitis. Uh, colitis can cause pain here. Um, obviously, the same problems as we can have the ovary on the left side. We can also see on the right side torsion or uh, you know cyst. Um, any of those could be responsible for pain on this side. Okay, one other thing we need to cover is the small bowel. So, um, you know, small bowel, when there's pain there, um, it causes what we call visceral type pain. So it's kind of poorly localized. It's hard for our body to figure out where exactly the pain is. And so um, patients typically describe pain sort of in the periumbilical region, so around the belly button. And so um, it's not uncommon for a patient, you know, who has appendicitis at the very beginning, they sort of have this vague um, uh, pain around the belly button, sort of in the center of the abdomen. And then, you know, as the uh, appendix bursts, right, as then uh, it spills its contents with bacteria and inflammation out into the peritoneal cavity, it causes a focal peritonitis, which is, you know, really uh, what's leading to uh, the pain in the right lower quadrant. But at the beginning, it's sort of this periumbilical pain. So, you know, small bowel, you know, enteritis, or even a like mesenteric ischemia of the small bowel, maybe it's the sort of vague, uh, poorly localized pain. Sometimes patients just say it's sort of all over pain. They'll point towards the center of the belly. So, um, so I got rid of the compass here, but think about the very center as sort of a vague visceral pain that could reflect other things like small bowel.
So while we're on the subject of abdominal pain, I do want to present a schematic for um, how I organize abdominal pain. So let's let's just focus on things in the abdomen so we can exclude the pleural space and exclude the diaphragm and uh, lungs and MI and all those things. But um, within the abdomen, there's organ pain, luminal pain, and peritoneal pain. So really organ pain, uh, what I mean by that is sort of um, the organ is enlarged and it's stretched, okay? And so what that does it stretches the capsule and so by stretching the capsule um, it causes sort of a sort of a constant uh, persistent pain okay and then on exam the things you'll look for is uh, sort of organomegaly um, and on imaging you'll look for enlargement of the organ so even the pancreas has a very fine very thin capsule uh, but when it stretches it has a lot of pain and then obviously the pancreas causes a lot of local inflammation which is painful as well Okay, so next is so-called luminal pain. So uh, luminal pain comes from uh, an obstructed hollow tube. And so imagine, you know, uh, in the abdomen, uh, you have many hollow tubes, many lumens. And so all these things are trying to you know, move something from one place to another, uh, some kind of liquid, right, or solid substance. And so um, if there's an obstruction, you know, peristalsis will continue. It's trying to squeeze down and move things in this direction. And so if there's an obstruction, that can be quite painful. And so the, the list of things that are hollow that can get obstructed, so you know the cystic duct, right, can cause biliary colic, the cholecystic duct, um, any sort of bowel, so a small bowel, large bowel, and a bowel obstruction, um, the ureters, when they get obstructed from a kidney stone, so nephrolithiasis is very painful. But the pattern here is that um, as opposed to constant pain that we saw with the organ pain, Luminal pain tends to cause, you know, episodes of pain. So pain that comes and goes, right? Sort of intermittent pain. And so the other term for this is sort of colicky pain. Um, so intermittent colicky pain is essentially peristalsis occurring against obstruction and then being relieved and going on and off again. Okay, so luminal pain is another pattern that you want to be able to pick up when you're interviewing your patients. Last but not least is peritoneal pain, which uh, represents an inflamed uh, peritoneum. So the, the peritoneum is the you know lining the peritoneal cavity, and uh, you know if you identify a focal peritoneal pain or peritonitis, you know that tells you that's where the problem is, or at least the maybe the problem's nearby. And um, let's say there's a viscous or something perforated. There's drainage of uh, bacterial contents and leaking and it's causing local inflammation so it gives you a clue where the problem really is and so it's really important to understand what are the peritoneal signs and how to locate these on physical examination but you know from the history um, it's kind of interesting in that uh, anything that aggravates or moves the peritoneum will worsen the pain and so um, sort of the textbook presentation is that a patient who's lying completely still and doesn't want to move um, that could be a sign that there's peritonitis because any sort of movement or jostling um, can aggravate the pain and make it worse. And so some of the questions I ask patients, you know, does walking or light jumping make it worse? You know, obviously people don't jump too often, but one thing I do ask everyone, ask them, you know, how'd you get to the hospital? And they may say in a car or in the ambulance. And then I say, when you're driving or riding in the ambulance, when they hit a bump or took a sharp turn, and everything moved, did that make the pain worse? And if they say yes, I'm really concerned about peritonitis. Um, and so on physical exam, obviously things like rebound tenderness um, can help you and other special maneuvers like the psoas sign can help identify whether there's you know irritation along the psoas muscle. So an inflamed peritoneum really helps you sort of localize where the problem is and it's definitely something you don't want to miss and uh, you should get really good at learning this on physical exam. So just to summarize a few things, you know, organ pain, uh, I typically think about, uh, you know, the liver, pancreas, spleen, kidneys, all these things have capsules, and when they're inflamed or enlarged, they hurt. So luminal pain, biliary colic, uh, um, obstruction of the cholecystic duct, small bowel obstruction, large bowel obstruction, uh, nephrolithiasis, all those things can cause a luminal type pain. Um, peritoneal pain, so a ruptured appendix causing appendicitis, any sort of ruptured viscous, you know, post-operative ruptured viscous uh, leading to intra-abdominal abscess, um, any, you know, ruptured diverticulum uh, causing diverticulitis and like a local abscess, that can cause peritonitis. So um, 
peritonitis, like I said, could be anywhere where there's peritoneum. So just understanding uh, the pattern of the pain, what are the organs that tend to cause that pattern, and then the location and other things from the history that can really help you understand uh, how to approach a patient with abdominal pain.